Well then, hi everyone, and thanks for joining us this evening or afternoon, depending on where you are from. I'm Kai, I work for the Austrian Economic Center, as well as the Friedrich August von Hayek Institute, which are both classical liberal think tanks based in Vienna, Austria. And it's my great pleasure to moderate today's webinar on coronavirus lockdowns, which I think is probably the hot button issue today. I mean, earlier this year, we've had already these kinds of lockdowns, these severe restrictions to our public, our economic, our social lives. And now we are in a similar situation yet again, as most European countries in the last um, two to three weeks have closed down everything once more from the UK, Spain, France, Italy, Germany, Austria, to Belgium and all the others. Um, basically life has stopped again at least at the moment, depending on which country, but in most countries, that's the case. Everything is closed from restaurants, cinemas, hotels, and pretty much everything. Uh, people are in many countries not allowed to leave their houses, except for uh, appropriate reasons. Um, meeting other people has become a great challenge and traveling has become in many regards an impossibility without prior testing or quarantine. The assumption is that none of this will stop until the virus is fully defeated, whenever that will be. Today, we will discuss these kinds of measures and I'm happy to have uh, the special guest with us, Jeffrey Tucker. Um, Jeffrey is the editorial director of the American Institute for Economic Research. He is the author of many thousands of articles. I think I see like every, every day a new article by Jeffrey. Um, he has written nine books, uh, which have been published in five languages. Um, the latest is his book called Liberty or Lockdown, which I think is quite uh, appropriate, obviously, for today's topic. Thanks, Jeffrey, for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, and, and I suppose you want me to give, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes and then open it up. Is that the idea? Exactly. So, I mean, already for the audience now, if you have any questions for Jeffrey, then please don't be shy. And if you're on Zoom, then type it in the Q&A box down below. And if you are watching it on Facebook, then simply write a comment. And my colleague backstage will, uh, I hope, forward me the question then. And in that sense, Jeffrey, uh, the floor is yours on lockdowns on uh, the Great Barrington Declaration, which the AIR has published. And what do you think about the current approach of governments around the world? Okay, thank you. Um, my thesis is that uh, that none of what's happening in the world today is necessary. Uh, I don't believe it will mitigate the disease. And it's going to cause immense social, cultural, economic harm, and that politically, we are um, in uh, dire straits, that the regimes have been so disrupted all over the world, for reasons that are uh, unclear. My own thesis, it's the thesis of my book and it's the one I've been working on since basically since January. I wrote my first article on this topic on January 27th, um, pleading with governments not to use their presumed quarantine power. Uh, my thesis is that all of this results not so much from conspiracy, but from intellectual error. And pe people are s suspicious of that. They think, oh, this is all because because people have made a mistake. It's like, yeah, I think this is what it's really behind it. I think if you doubt that, you you don't understand the power of ideas. But it, but but one one bad idea um, can lead to the unraveling of civilization. And in the case of of these lockdowns, we have a lot of bad ideas. Uh, it's a little bit of a shock to us, I think. When I say us, I mean basically Austrians, maybe classical liberals, liberals. But but also when I say us, I mean basically everything and everybody, we didn't have any idea, most of us didn't have any idea that governments were capable uh, of doing, that we didn't know they had the power, or much less the will, to do what they've done to us, which is um, fundamentally injure everything we've called human rights for the last 500 years, and reverse the progress of civilization over the last 1,000 years towards the rule of law and certain presumed uh, f equality of, of, of freedom. And we're introducing a new caste system and a new feudalism, all um, for reasons that I don't think are justified. And, uh, and we're very close to discovering this. I think um, sometime next year, there's going to be a real reckoning to figure out how the hell this happened. So the purpose of my remarks today is just going to map out a little bit of what I see is 
the failings um, so that we can get a, a little bit of a grip on what we're dealing with. Uh, we also have to recognize that all of us, you know, what, you know, whether economists or journalists or just run, run of the day, you know, sort of liberals, or people who care about about the future progress and, and freedom, that sort of thing, have been completely blindsided to discover uh, this other regime that's existed out there, apparently in the shadows for a long time. We didn't know that epidemiologists had such plans for our lives. We didn't believe that such arrogance could ever exist in the world. I mean, it used to exist among the economists when they used to model macroeconomics and think that they could turn a dial here and turn a dial there. Oh, this make money supply go up and we'll make unemployment go down. Or if the aggregate demand falls because of the recession, we can just boost government spending and that will cause the recession to go away. And so, so economists have been de dealing with sort of naive modeling uh, now for uh, you know, a better part of 90 years probably. And it's mostly fallen apart and it's been fall it's fallen apart for the last, say, 30 or 40 years. But epidemiology is actually in a very primitive state, uh, you, doing all the same stupid things that economists used to do that uh, led to such calamities and that have basically stopped doing. All the epidemiologists have picked up on it. So uh, I want to talk about some of those things. This is why there's a bit of a parallel between uh, the Hayekian project and the anti-lockdown movement, you know, the, the, it's very similar. Like Hayek's, Hayek's critique of, 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 of central planning pertains also to the epidemiological models too in ways I hope to explain. But let me just read to you really quickly um, uh, a document that came out from the uh, apparently incoming Biden administration, all right? So um, to understand something about American politics, and we'll get to this a little bit later, the relationship of lockdowns and politics, but Trump was the first mover on the lockdown. So February 8th, he locked down, uh, locked down flights from China, which is unprecedented. And he was been anxious to drive a wedge between the US and China for a very long time, and I think very unnecessarily. So the tariffs came first. And so the first thing he wanted to do was call up the Wuhan virus and block China, Chinese flights into America. And, and, uh, and, and I guess nobody was surprised by that, but actually, I mean, it's, it's an outrageous attack on free trade and free movement of people. So that was the first problem. On March 8th, the Austin mayor uh, banned uh, the South by Southwest conference in Austin, Texas, which was, would normally attract something like 250,000 people. So just in the stroke of a pen, uh, got rid of a, a million different contracts involving housing, hotels, and p plane travel, and you know, just, it's like, it's just an egregious, fundamentally un-American action. Four days later, uh, Trump went on national television on his own decision, decided to block all flights from Europe and said everybody has to come back by Monday. Uh, you know, a dictatorial action that is not permitted under the U.S. Constitution. There's never been, no power like that has been ever exercised in American history by any American president. It was, it was an egregious and appalling thing. Um, the next day, his own uh, CDC uh, with the White House imprimatur uh, released what amounts to a Stalinist plan for school lockdowns and business shutdowns and that sort of thing. Um, it was classified. Uh, the first, as far as I know, public release of this document came out from the American Institute for Economic Research. You can see it on our website. Uh, we have it printed there. So if you think if you think the Trump administration has always represented, you know, laissez-faire, open it up kind of position that's completely wrong. They were the first movers on lockdowns. Um, and so as the uh, as the campaign progressed, however, uh, Trump realized that that uh, he did not get elected president to destroy American life. That's a, a slightly uh, regrettable thing to have done. And he began to kind of reverse his position, driving then his opponent, uh, Biden, into the opposite corner of being in favor of the very thing that Trump did uh, while opposing what Trump now supported. So it's a little complicated for, for foreign observers to understand how it is the Democrats became the lockdown party, even though the Republicans began as a lockdown party and how the Republicans are the open it up party, you know, uh, even though they began as the lockdown party. So I just wanna read you the statement from the uh, incoming Biden administration. Social distancing is not a light switch. It is a dial. President-elect Biden will direct the CDC to provide specific evidence-based guidance for how to turn the dial up and down relative to the level of risk and degree of viral spread in a community, including when to open or close certain businesses, bars, restaurants, or other spaces, when to open or close schools, 
and what steps they need to make to, to, to make cl classroom, classrooms and facilities safe, safe, appropriate restrictions on size of gatherings, and when to issue stay-at-home restrictions. Right? So this is what the new constitution for America, the government on its own, uh, Biden and with, with massive power, nuclear weapons in consultation with a bunch of scientific cranks, um, will decide when and to what extent we can exercise our rights, whether your business can open or close, whether it can force you back into your home under quarantine how many people can gather where we can go to the movies, go to Broadway, go to sports shows or anything. So this overrides every bit of Western uh, constitutional uh, traditions and obviously represents a profound attack on human rights and, and human freedom and it cannot be allowed to stand. And how any government could just willy nilly issue such an order uh, deserves cries out for explanation, you know? Um, since, my whole life has been dedicated to uh, somehow securing uh, more freedom for people, uh, economic and otherwise. Now you have governments basically assuming unto themselves totalitarian um, uh, powers over human rights, not just in the United States, but apparently all over the world. So we're in a epic crisis right now. Let us not doubt it. This is not a temporary situation. Um, this is not uh, something that people really should be debating, actually, if you're a civilized person. You should immediately see what's wrong uh, with this. So let me go into a little bit of the history of how this whole thing came about. Um, the problem really began 20 years ago. And it began when a bunch of uh, computer modelers got involved in the business of disease mitigation. You know, how and why they did is, is really unclear. It's, sometimes I wonder if it all ha has something to do with the uh, confusion over language, you know? Um, uh, 20 years ago, uh, computers had a real problem with, with viruses and, <laughs> and, and, and computers would be working very well. And then a pathogen would suddenly show up in email and eat, eat the hard drive up and, and burrow itself into the networks and make, make the dreams of, of uh, computers sort of null and void. So a major problem that they had to deal with in the computer industry um, 20 years, years ago and over the subsequent uh, 10 years uh, was, was dealing with, with the, the presence of pathogens in computer networks. And so I think, you know, I can't prove this, but you know, how is it that Bill Gates got so interested in this topic? You know, I mean, it's, it, this might have something to do with it. And what's interesting when you watch his, his talks on uh, TED Talks on viruses, he talks about them exactly this way, as exogenous to the system that he's trying to build. Everything's going fine, society's going along fine, and suddenly a foreign pathogen enters into it and threatens the very functioning of the whole of society. And the only way we can deal with this is to block it, eradicate it, suppress it, make it go away, just as he did in the computer industry. Well, the problem is that uh, pathogens uh, in a biological sense have always been with us. They've been with us for a million years. We co-evolved with them and we developed immune systems to process them and deal with them. They're very complicated, sometimes simple, sometimes complicated. Uh, viruses are different. This, this just what happens. This particular virus is a mild respiratory virus that is not a threat to 99.7% of the world's population and is almost exclusively a danger to uh, uh, people over the age of, of 75 with co comorbidities, average age of death around the world is 82. In the US it's 79, 78, 79, something like that. Um, the CDC said that only 6% of the people who have died from COVID died only with COVID, only because of COVID. Otherwise, 94% um, uh, had other problems like, like heart disease and diabetes and uh, extreme obesity and things that made the immune system malfunction. So this is the reality of this virus, um, which, which oddly, we're nine months into this and hardly anybody even talks about this fact. I mean, it's just actually the most irresponsible amount of journalism, which is another subject I'll get to, but let's just talk about these disease models. So 20 years ago, they started dabbling this idea, at the idea of what are we going to do in society, with society when the pathogen uh, comes along? And, and the idea was uh, to deploy um, agent-based modeling to uh, 
somehow prevent its spread. And the way you do that is by having people separate, right? So um, six feet apart, um, you know, don't gather in large crowds, um, and then the virus uh, somehow d doesn't attach, can't find a host, and then it's never explained what happens to it. Just the models are very strange in this sense. Another thing that the models do is they all, without exception, presume a homogeneity of risk, right? So that everybody in the population is equally susceptible, which is obviously untrue. Uh, another thing they tend to do is try to predict the amount of death. So these guys really quite had a lot of things going uh, from 2000, the year 2000, other, other ways to, to, to 2005. By the way, as far as I know, none of these early prediction models and uh, the, these, these computer models were, were, had, none of them were trained in um, the history of pathogens. They'd never had any experience in mitigating disease they um, had never read uh, cell biology for dummies, which you can download from Amazon, which if you haven't, I'd, and, and you're confused by any of this stuff, I'd recommend you do it. They were mostly physicists like Neil Ferguson um, at the Imperial College, or just a, a computer modeler like Robert Glass in the United States, or like Harvard's Mark Lipsitch, uh, another one of these early modeling guys, an epidemiologist, but not trained in any kind of medical field. He was trained in this kind of uh, agent-based modeling tradition uh, of disease mitigation and suppression. This is a very different idea from traditional um, public health epidemiology. And 20 years ago, my favorite philosopher King, as far as I'm concerned, she's, she's the Hayek of infectious diseases. Her name is Sunetra Gupta at Oxford University, wrote an article in which she said, I can she says uh, that these models, she was panicked about them. She said, these models can serve to obfuscate rather than clarify, or at best add nothing at all to the situation other than to create the illusion of control. And I think that's ultimately what we're dealing with here is an illusion of control. And in that sense, there's also an analogy there with Hayek's critique of central planning, you know, this illusion of control. It's the same sort of thing you imagine there's something you can control out there by pulling levers and, and, and turning dials rather than recognizing that um, human life is a process and also the way um, uh, viral uh, pathogens affect the human community is, is also an, an evolved process that, that is international and can't be controlled by, um, can't be predicted by models, much less controlled by um, politicians. So early on, um, it, we had a problem with the models. Uh, even in, in January and February, we saw these models coming out that were predicting, making outrageous predictions of death. Again, assuming homogeneous risk on the part of the entire population, um, pre presuming previous uh, infection fatality ratios from things like um, SARS-CoV-1, which vexed the world from 2002 to 2003, they just wrote those into the models and came up with outlandish predictions. So on February 27th, the New York Times predicted that 6.6 .6 million Americans were going to die from SARS-CoV-2. Now he didn't say what was the basis for that prediction was. This was Daniel McNeil, reporter from the New York Times, degree in uh, rhetoric from Berkeley University in California. Uh, he didn't say, except that he said something about this current passage and reminds him of H1N1 from 1918, reminds him of it, just, you know, reminds him of it. He, knowing nothing really about, about the essential medical characteristics of viruses, this is what he said. And that's what sent the American public into a, a complete panic. And uh, then the Imperial College uh, got a little more precise and thought that 2.2 million Americans were going to do. Now, each of these models are all very interesting. They're like, if society continues to function as normal, uh, then uh, this is what's going to happen, right? Uh, based on these following assumptions. It took them months, by the way, to even really reveal their models. And it was only after that that we realized that they had this assumption of heterogeneity baked into them and, and certain uh, implausible assumptions about the infection uh, fatality uh, ratio and so on. Uh, but at the time we didn't know this. And so there was just a lot of panic. And then this whole industry uh, got into play. These people began to come out of the woodwork, you know, interviewed by the press. Oh, you have to lock down, you have to lock down. So when did this idea come along? Well, the idea of locking down in the presence of a pathogen, it was completely novel. Nothing like this has ever been tried 
in the history of, 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 of infectious diseases. It was first proposed, as far as I know, in 2005 at a White House conference called by uh, George uh, W. Bush, who was a bit of an apocalyptic president and invited both medical specialists and computer modelers to the White House to adjust the Center for Disease Control's recommendations in light of what happens in the event of bioterrorism or, or a new pathogen arriving. And the medical doctors presented evidence, which consistent with the adv advice of the time, which is that you don't do anything to disturb normal social functioning at all. You certainly don't close the schools. Stay home orders are inconceivable. You don't shut businesses. That's a disaster. This is an attack on civil society. And you don't, certainly you don't use quarantines because those have never worked. And our experience in 1918 showed those that it didn't work. They only lead to uh, 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 ter terrible social, cultural, economic destruction. Instead, we, we need to protect society and get smart, figure out who the vulnerable populations are and, and warn them to stay away until the pathogen uh, spreads among the non-vulnerable population and our human operating systems can, can upgrade themselves in, in the presence of the new pathogen, the operating system we call the immune system. And that's how we mitigated disease uh, throughout the whole course of the 20th century in, with intelligence and a focus on doctor-patient uh, patient relationships and letting the medical community manage it, not, not politicians. Uh, Bush was shown evidence from the other side too, from the, from the agent-based modelers, <coughs> which he found much more impressive and much more interesting. This is a guy who invaded multiple countries after 9-11, you recall. So he had no problem with this idea of uh, imagining business closures and school closures and creating disaster all around. You know, this is George W. Bush. And he wrote the plans of the modelers into the Center for Disease Control's uh, 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 plans. I had discovered this in 2005. Uh, at, at the time, there was this avian bird flu that everybody got really scared about at the time. It turns out uh, the only, uh, the only uh, uh, living beings that, that were affected by the bird flu were birds themselves. They, ne <laughs> the flu never jumped from birds to human beings, so that was kind of a false alarm. Um, in 2009, um, the Americans didn't experience this. This is a big deal in Europe, though. Uh, the H1N1 came along, and which is the same, a, ver a version of the same flu that, that uh, killed so many people in 1918. And Europe went absolutely insane. And so there were uh, flu vaccines that were delivered all over the place. Public health authorities were screaming. There was a widespread panic and, and a lot of money was ma made because you know, governments were uh, allocating billions to disease mitigation. That's, and it turned out to amount to absolutely nothing uh, or not that much. It turned out to be a, a mild flu season, H1N1 2009. So after which the World Health Organization issued a report that came out in uh, well, there was two reports, one from the World Health Organization in uh, 2000, yeah, I think it was, no, it was 2009, uh, that were blasting what they called the disease industry. You know, the, that this combination of, of, uh, of, of pharmaceutical companies, hysterical media looking for attention, uh, uh, public health totalitarians whipping up politicians into a frenzy, spending billions of dollars for no reason. They said this whole, but, the World Health Organization said, look, we don't need more disease planning, we need less, because <laughs> this planning uh, nearly destroyed everything. And then, uh, then there was a, a European Council, it's, it's, I'm sorry, I don't know that much about European politics, there was a Council of Europe, uh, had a special uh, uh, session, a study group, re that released a report in 2011, that again, attacked uh, this whole industry that was developing around H1N1 of 2009 saying, these people are uh, catastrophic. I mean, what, they're, what they were planning, what they could have done to us would have abolished all of our rights and liberties and done nothing to mitigate disease. So anyway, that's the kind of background. They were just waiting for a chance. I mean, 15 years of this nonsense, these people, um, it was very interesting because they became professors of universities and 15 years long enough for the professors to have students and for the students to get jobs. They held conferences, they had journals, they, they met in, in fancy hotel rooms year after year after year, uh, developing something like a, an, a, an agent-based modeling system of totalitarian control of society. They were never checked, they only spoke to each other, they lived in their own little bubbles and mostly this intellectual paradigm developed without the assistance of traditional epidemiologists and public health professionals, all of whom were against it. 
Um, as liberals uh, in this room that are listening, I would highly recommend to you Donald Henderson's great treatise from 2006. And if you just, I don't know how you find it, but just like, it's on AIR's website. If you look up uh, uh, you know, something like how free society deals with pandemics, uh, he wrote a brilliant, he was getting kind of aged at the time. I think it was something like 80 years old at the time, but he wrote a big attack on these agent-based models in 2006 and, and attacked mandatory ma masks and travel restrictions and stay at home orders and school closures and business closures and restrictions on gatherings. He attacked the whole thing. And at the end of the article said with complete, with, with wonderful footnotes, Donald Henderson's the guy who eradicated the smallpox, by the way. So this is not a shabby guy. And he said, the most important thing you can do in the presence of pathogens is maintain normal social functioning. If you follow the plans of these crazy people, you will, you will turn a manageable disease into a social and economic catastrophe. That's what he said in 2016. And everybody said, oh, old man, don't worry about people like that. So this, this whole industry has been, been waiting to seize the day. And then of course the Wuhan virus SARS-CoV-2 came along and it seemed like a perfect opportunity for them to deploy their uh, schemes, their massive social experiment. Now. Once the hysteria began to develop, and this is my second point, uh, there's a do something bias that began to develop in, within the system. We live in a world in which states are supposed to fix every problem, right? No matter what it is. And so there was a do something bias. Well, we have to do something, what should we do? So the politicians began to panic and began to cry out to uh, the, uh, the modelers, what do you recommend? Well, there was Neil Ferguson, you know, ready to go. There was Carter Meacher in the US. There was Mark Lipsitch from Harvard social distancing, targeted layered containment, uh, 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 all the whole apparatus of, of uh, uh, mandatory masks and uh, targeted layered containment is another word. They, oh, non-pharmaceutical interventions is what they call them. Non-NPIs, the MPIs, really. Uh, we used to call MP, what we call MPIs and tar targeted layered containment, we used to just call the totalitarian state. They're ready to go. And so politicians uh, essentially turned over the apparatus of, of control of society from the courts and from our legal traditions and from the people and democracy and the legislatures and took upon themselves power of totalitarian powers of executive rule. Let's do something bias. And I think it's very interesting. I have some sense, I can't prove it, that a lot of these, a lot of these politicians were working off the advice of public health professionals um, and these disease modelers who imagined that SARS-CoV-2 is gonna be very much like SARS-CoV-1. Um, now, this is a, a faulty assumption, and, and here's why. Uh, SARS-CoV-1 was actually quite deadly. Like if you contracted it, um, you, you're, you're, you stood like a 50% chance of dying from it, it was, but didn't discriminate by age. It was a wicked, wicked disease. What's interesting about uh, SARS-CoV-1 though is that it, the World Health Organization often takes credit for having controlled it. But in fact, what you learn from the history of pathogens like this is that very bad viruses die very quickly because they kill their hosts. And then they can't live to find a new host. And so they burn themselves out really rapidly. Uh, very uh, uh, smart uh, pathogens um, are mild. They don't kill the host. And, and therefore they can uh, transmit further and further and further. They become very widespread. These are smart viruses. SARS-CoV-2, is a smart virus, SARS-CoV-1 is a dumb virus. So what you see in the history of these viruses, especially as they pertain to respiratory illnesses like this, is that there's an inverse relationship between severity and prevalence. The more severe they are, uh, the more, quick, more quickly they burn themselves out, um, and the milder they are, the more they spread, and the, the fewer people they vex and kill. So, so that inverse relationship was never assumed in any part of the models. But, and yet, that's a, a persistent uh, trait of all these kinds of respiratory flu-like illnesses. All right, let me get on to my third point, which is a confusion over cause and effect. Let me check my time, too. Oh, wow, I've been going on too long. I'm going to have to move really quickly here. But I do, for the question and answer, I do want you to have enough information to ask um, printed questions. Um, 
The third one is a confusion over cause and effect. Now we experience this in economics all the time, right? So uh, an, ex an, ex an example of a confusion over cause and effect is this, like let's say there's an expansion of the money supply and pressure on the prices and the prices start to go up. So what do the politicians do? They implement price controls, okay? So what are you doing there? You're, you're trying to blot you're trying to control the effect as a way of blotting out the cause. So you're not dealing with the cause, you're only trying to control the effect, trying to game outcomes without um, any kind of logical consistency. It's the same thing when recessions happen. One of the marks of recession is the decline in aggregate demand. So you're gonna boost um, government spending to increase aggregate demand to make the recession go away. Okay, that's a, that, again, that's a fallacy. It's exactly the same thing with these epidemiological models. Here's the way it goes. They observe that when a virus starts to burn itself out, the R0, which is the transmission rate, very difficult to measure. And again, there's assumption within the R0 of homogeneity across population groups, which is completely faulty. It's very difficult to know what the, uh, the uh, um, transmission rate really is. But once the, the R0 drops below one, then the virus begins to burn itself out. That's that's a, a sign. It's a maybe measurable, probably not, but at least in theory, once the virus begins to go away, the R0 drops below one. So what you have is all these people, and this is why Europe's locking down again here. They think they can discern what the R0 is and they see it rising above one. And so they're like, okay, everybody stay home. Everybody stay out of the movie theaters and out of the bars and restaurants. We're gonna drop the infection rate down <coughs> to less than one so that one person won't infect one other person and will slow the spread, if not stop the spread entirely. And then the virus will uh, pack its bags and, and move back to Wuhan or the Mars or wherever they think it came from, right? So this is, again, a, a, a confusion over cause and effect. And I promise you, if you listen carefully to the public health author authorities in, in Germany and, and Austria and Spain, and Italy, and even England and the United States right now, they all talk this way, that they can manipulate the r not to blot out the actual cause. If we, as intelligent, powerful people, can cause, cause the infection... Uh, the uh, transmission rate to decline, then the virus will go away. That's what they're doing. Without regard to human rights, human freedom, that's what they think they're doing. It's all a mistake. It's a confusion of cause and effect. Um, for number four is, um, has to do with the fear, uh, the fear of the virus, which I mean, is very primal, I think, in people. People want to get away from viruses. They um, in the Middle Ages, this is the way they always handled viruses, was to run away from them. In grade school, kids often play a game in which you know, the girls have cooties or lurgy or something like that. You have to get away from them. So people have this desire to get away from pathogens. One of the great ambitions of the 20th century among public health authorities was to um, moderate that, that, that primal sense of fear and help people understand that the worst possible thing you could have is a naive immune system getting a pathogen and having your, 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 your system getting used to it as, as what, uh, as vaccines do, or just getting the disease does, if it's mild, that's what you want to do. Um, then, then your, your bodies are protected. Sunetra Gupta says that one of the reasons that we live so long and so prosperous lives in the 20th century is that we were exposed to so many pathogens after World War I, so much immigration, so much travel, that we got stronger and stronger and stronger and lived ever better, longer lives because we got rid of the naive immune systems that we have and replaced them with very sophisticated, strong uh, uh, immune systems. What lockdowns do is they uh, re-naive us. They, they take away the intelligence of our immune systems and make us vulnerable to something even much worse, which is what's going on in New Zealand and Australia right now. And that's also why we've had shifting rationales. Remember initially, at least in the US, the rationale for lockdown was to, preserve hospital space. Then it changed um, uh, just gradually. And then finally it just ended up being, uh, oh, just suppress and stop, stop the virus, stop the spread, which signs all over New York today say stop the spread. This is the biggest lie you will ever see. There's no such thing as stopping the spread of a virus like this. It's just crazy. You don't want to do it anyway. This is not Ebola. This is SARS-CoV-2. Finally, there's the public choice element here um, with the politicians. Uh, they want power and they enjoy exercising it. And the media uh, cheers them on. And what they've done with these lockdowns is, I've argued, is create a kind of a new feudalism, uh, dividing the world between essential and unessential workers. You've got the upper class bourgeoisie that can work from home, 
uh, and enjoying their lives on Zoom calls while making the working classes deliver them food uh, to their doors. <clears throat> and you go to the uh, uh, restaurants now and the bourgeoisie can sit and suck on uh, liquor and eat shrimp cocktail, but the wait staff has to come to you with masks and with rubber gloves, um, looking like diseased, dirty people. So, uh, so what we've done is reverse the modern system of equality and democracy and human rights between all people, which we believe in, and created a new caste system, the unclean, who we are forcing to bear the burden of herd immunity. Let them get sick so that we can stay well. That is the underlying ethos all of which violates what Gupta calls the social contract of infectious diseases, and I'll leave you with this. Her view, and I think it's a correct one, and, um, and that's something that she's taught me this year. It's not, it's not something I think that libertarians and classical liberals and Austrians need to start thinking about. Pathogens will always be with us. This is not the last one that's come along, certainly not the first one. They've been here for millions of years. We still have to decide to have progress, human rights, equality, democracy, modernity, and live hopeful, long, good lives. And if we try to run away from them, we are living in violation of that social contract because running away and suppression only forces uh, uh, the voiceless and the powerless to bear the burden of herd immunity for the rest of us. Uh, a place like New Zealand, what they did was fundamentally immoral. They said, screw you, the rest of the world, you get sick, we're gonna stay all clean and pure. And Australia did something very similar. And every country has done something similar. Make, make the workers and peasants get out there and do the work for us while we enjoy our lives at home. This is wrong. It's a violation of the social contract. It's, it's contrary to modernity and to all ideas about freedom. So th this is a fundamental attack on civilization itself my argument is that it's rooted in an intellectual error that's gone utterly mad. What are we going to do about it? We need to get smart. We need to learn. We need to read up about the history of infectious diseases, learn about cell biology, study under serious legitimate pu public health economists like um, Martin Kuldorf and Jay Bhattacharya and Sinatra Gupta, all of whom crafted the Great Barrington Declaration, which helped change the, um, the debate in the world. And, and my friends, we have another intellectual battle on our hands. It's not just now against socialism. It's not just against fascism. It's not just against bloody wars that destroy lives. Now it's against the lockdowners. A new enemy has risen among us and we must dedicate all of our efforts to stopping them and making sure that nothing like this will ever happen again. Thank you very much. Awesome, Frank, I mean, awesome uh, all your talk but also uh, obviously frustrating news uh, thanks nonetheless for uh, this talk um, again I can just repeat we only we have another 20 minutes uh, if you have any questions then uh, you can use the Q&A box here or my colleague has told me that there's a sizable crowd over at Facebook so if you have questions then he will let me know about them for the moment I'm the moderator so I'm arrogant enough and will ask uh, a few questions myself. Um, what I'm just wondering about is that obviously when you look earlier this year during the first round of lockdowns, um, when you look at Italy back then, or when you look now at countries like France or Belgium, you do have hospitals being overwhelmed by patients. You have sort of uh, intensive care units, sort of a shortage of them. Uh, at the moment, like I think from France, you have patients that are uh, sick of coronavirus getting flown over to Germany so that they're getting treated there because there's no capacity anymore in France. Mm -hmm. In these sort of dire situations, isn't there, I mean, it's not really only based on models or something like that because you can see the actual results in a sense, like mm -hmm. in Northern Italy in March where you it almost looked like sort of war zones or something like that. Yeah, it that, kind of looked like it kind of looked like that, and it looked like that a little bit in New York. Once you start to look at it, at the the, the actual specifics of the New York case, there were you know, two or three hospitals that had about forty eight hours worth of problems. But what was amazing is that we had a central plan for the entire. So here's the problem: 
politicians think they know what hospitals should be used for. So they reserved all the hospitals for coronavirus patients. 350 hospitals throughout the rest of the US had to lay off workers because they weren't allowed to take in uh, people for, a non, uh, for elective surgeries or regular cancer screenings or diagnostics. I mean, this, co- this country abolished dentistry for three months. I mean, it's just unbelievable. So, you know, so the real question is not so much like, uh, what do you, what do you do with a virus that has a lot of people getting sick at the same time? The question is like, what? Why are these particular cases, these, these particular uh, uh, hospital systems, unable to scale in the presence of new business? Which is, you know, that's that's how hospitals make money, at least under a capitalist system. Is they have patients, right? So ideally, you you do want occupancy to be 70, 80, 90, uh, even 100 percent. I mean, so this is not a bad thing. This means uh, good business for hospitals. But when you're living under a socialist system of healthcare and uh, where there's no response to supply and demand uh, baked into the system, now you suddenly you have extreme limits on, on supply. And this is what we're really talking about. This is an economic problem, not so much a, a, a disease problem. So you know, here you have a situation where a, a socialist system of healthcare provision is really coming back to bite us, right? I mean, you don't have this problem in other industries. You know, if you have too many people lining up at, uh, at, at uh, your restaurant, you build a second restaurant, you know? I mean, this is, when too many movie people want to go to the movies, you get a second movie theater or you, you open up another screen. I mean, the, in markets, things scale. But since for whatever reason, the world has decided that the government should, should dictate how many hospitals there are and how many doctors there are, how many nurses there are, and how many people they should, uh, should be, uh, make available, um, when it, whenever there's an emergency like this, uh, it, can't, it, can't, it can't adapt. So that, that is a, a, a more structural problem. Um, so what we should do in light of this experience is have a free market actually in healthcare. And I'm sorry to, no, it sounds like it's changing the subject because it's actually a really important matter, but you don't want to destroy society much less uh, as we did in the United States, ban patients from hospitals and reserve them exclusively for coronavirus uh, patients. That was, a, that was a, a real disaster. That's, I mean, it's going to create health problems for, for two years hence. Yeah, that's actually a good point. I remember here in uh, Germany, the discussion right now is that basically we have enough beds in hospitals, but we don't have enough staff. In Austria, we don't have enough beds uh, because nobody really bought any new beds during the summer when everyone was talking about a second wave coming in the fall. Um, so there's a lot of confusion about management. that. Yeah. It's bad management. It's bad management, and the politicians can't fix it. I mean, that's the thing. When you see something a failure on this level, and you turn it over to the politicians to mitigate, they're only going to make it worse. That's what they. That's what they specialize in. Yeah. So the Great Barrington uh, Declaration that uh, the AIR obviously uh, organized, mm-hmm. I think, is sort of, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is sort of proposing that normal life is continuing, mm-hmm. but those who would those who would be in danger when they get infected, infected by the coronavirus, like the elderly, they would be sort of um, protected in a very special way. Is that correct? Or would you basically it's an okay, say- It's an okay way to put it. There's nothing, it's not anything unusual about the Great Barrington Declaration. It was the basic strength, principles of cell biology and public health. For generations, older people have known that during the flu season, they want to uh, avoid the uh, Justin Bieber concert. You know, you don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to, in the middle of a flu season, uh, find yourself at uh, the World Series, a game of baseball. You know, I mean, it's, you don't want to take unnecessary risks when your immune system is weak. And people have always known this. So the human rationality is ca- uh, capable of solving this problem on its own. So it's not as if the authors of the Great, and if you read the Great, Great Branton Declaration carefully, they never actually advocate any particular government-based policy. What they're suggesting is that we use intelligence uh, to, to manage the disease with, with wisdom and clarity about, about the science b- behind it. So now an exception might be something like long-term care facilities where, where people are kind of bedridden. <clears throat> and, and it's really striking in the US, 80% of the death in, um, in Connecticut, in the state of Connecticut, uh, was in long-term care facilities. And I think overall, it's been about 40% in the US. I'm not sure what it is in, in Italy and Germany and Austria, but it's, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that this disease has been the same all over the world. The demographics are almost identical. Now, in that case, 
you, what you really do want to do is have wise management of the long-term care facility. So, so for example, you might have to pay the staff uh, an extra uh, wage to st stay there <clears throat> during the course of the pandemic. So, um, so we can get through the worst of it. Herd immunity can be achieved among the non-vulnerable population, then things can go back to normal. So what we did, I think, it's not clear what we did actually, but we might have just delayed herd immunity among the people who could have handled the disease just fine, either asymptomatic or maybe it's a mild cold or something like that. We delayed that as long as possible, leaving our elderly um, to die of, of sadness, loneliness and despair, which is a huge problem. They can't see their families. It's like so cruel and evil. So that's not what the Great Barrington Declaration is advocating. They're advocating that we get on with the project of, of herd immunity so we can don't prolong the pain, but but deal with it right away so that we can move on with normal, normal life again. Um, and it's even worse in the case of New York. And again, I can't speak to whether the issue in Italy, but I bet you anything you have similar scandals there. But in New York, they force long-term care facilities to take in coronavirus patients. So leaving you know, something like uh, more than 10,000, could it be 20 or 30,000 people to die as a result of deliberate exposure. So they did the opposite of focused protection. They did uh, focused uh, transmission, you know, and infection. The, the people who could handle it least were exposed first. I mean, it was the greatest failure of central planning you can possibly ever imagine. Uh, so anyway, this idea of herd immunity, by the way, is very, it's like everybody should study it and understand it. The, but when you, when you read about it, don't just go to Wikipedia. What you're going to get there is a, is a, is a pharmaceutical definition of herd immunity. you like consider under citrus parabus conditions, a new pathogen comes along and you've got a vaccine. You only need to vac vaccinate about 70% and the rest uh, you don't have to. It's a mathematical probability issue, um, depending on certain rates of transmission, um, how many people need to be immune in order for the virus to uh, decline to find any more hosts, okay? So the, the typical definition then is 70%, but that does not pertain in real life. There are other sources of immunity other than um, uh, what you can find in serological tests. There's T cells, there's cross immunities from other diseases. These are real factors. I mean, ask yourself why it is that there are only seven deaths in Taiwan and, and something like 30 infections and almost no testing whatsoever, and yet high population dis densities um, and, and no lockdowns at all, at all. I mean, they had fewer, far fewer lockdowns than, than, than Sweden. They're only bested by Tanzania and Belarus, all right? So, and yet they have no problem. The, the reason is that back in 2002 and 2003, they had a terrible problem with, with SARS-CoV-2, uh, SARS-CoV-1. And, and the cross immunities there have protected the population against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, uh, so that, that's, that's the reason for that. The immune system does work. And so there have been a lot of studies uh, concerning uh, uh, the COVID-19, uh, how, um, how many people need to uh, get it and get immune to it in order to create the herd immunity. And the estimates drop as low as 10% given T cell immunity and cross immunity from other, other diseases, including uh, the, the common cold, which is a version of coronavirus and, and even the flu, uh, we found out in the last week, apparently will also protect you. Yeah, so uh, considering we know that at least the coronavirus uh, is dangerous, at least to some vulnerable groups, I was wondering, but at the same time, you obviously mentioned that governments uh, basically central planning our entire life is from a classical perspective, obviously extremely dangerous. Um, I was wondering if you have sort of that interplay between liberty, but also self-responsibility, responsibility for your own fellow human beings, mm -hmm. is there at least a case to be made that we as private citizens, we as, as people on the street sort of do, do care about the virus in a sense, for instance, yes. by wearing masks indoors no. or by- no, 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 it's the opposite. You have an obligation. Your obligation is to, is to get out there and live your regular life. You have a moral obligation to your citizens, your fellow citizens, as a, as a non-vulnerable person. And I'm guessing that most everybody watching here is non-vulnerable. If you are hiding from SARS-CoV-1, uh, SARS-CoV-2, I'm sorry, you are doing a disservice to humanity and violating the social contract and probably engaged in a moral activity as far as I'm concerned. You have an obligation to get out there and contribute to herd immunity. 
that I would say that's a moral obligation. So if you're hiding under your bed and think you're doing any favors for anybody, you're not. You're contributing to the creation of a feudal caste system that is causing other people to suffer while you luxuriate in your wealth and your riches and your, and your happy life at home. And I think it's disgusting and it needs to stop. You need to get out there and take a risk because your risks will uh, act as a benevolent contribution to getting over this disease. You cannot hide. And the more you hide, the more immoral you are, as far as I'm concerned. So yes, you have an absolute moral obligation. And that moral obligation is to get out there and take a risk and contribute to herd immunity. I believe this fundamentally. And if you don't uh, agree with that, you, there's something you do not understand about viruses and freedom. That is not where I thought it would go, but very good. <laughs> um, great. So um, uh, we have a question from the audience, which is that uh, the way that the mainstream media has sort of tackled this entire issue, uh, do you think, in a sense, there will be a reckoning one day for them, as well as the uh, as politicians who have done that? Or will we sort of, I mean, you hinted at it. Uh, at the beginning of your talk, will there be sort of this situation as we have it today for much, much longer and people will just get accustomed to it and accept it? These people have been been thoroughly disgusting uh, using this virus just to get clicks in a 24 hour uh, uh, news cycle and, uh, and exploiting people's fears for their own personal profits. And it's uh, been irresponsible and exploitative and, and contrary to the way the media has always worked. You know, in 1957, 58, the New York Times, calm the public down. In 1968-69, they calm the public down. Uh, even in uh, 2006, the New York Times was, was urging everybody to, if you get sick, go see your doctor. That was the fullness of their advice. Somehow in 2020, the media has been fanning the, the, the flames of political panic and, and causing a, a, a mass Munchausen syndrome and, and panic and, and uh, disease fears among the public. And I think it's, it's absolutely grotesque and there absolutely should be a reckoning. I don't know what that looks like entirely, but the, I, th I think that the way the media has behaved this year, uh, they deserve to bear and some of the moral culpability along with the political class for this, yes. Do you think that uh, politicians um, will, let's say it does, a vaccine or something like that, will they turn around and sort of get back to normal or will that continue indefinitely? Well, I remember one great article that was published on AIR on Bob Higgs's wretched effect and how many, many things will continue to stick around a lot of restrictions. Do you think that will be the uh, case? They're gonna can... try to, yeah, they're going to try to stick them around me. I read the statement from the Biden, the incoming Biden administration. They're going to try to... Uh, keep the, uh, the controls on as long as possible. I think it's really gonna come up to people getting educated uh, about, about the calamity that's happened. I mean, in the United States today, what happened when they, when they closed all the schools is that uh, women uh, quit, quit work and uh, went, went home to take care of the children. So we have a lower rate of, of, of female employment uh, of childbearing age now than we had in 1988. So this is the destruction of a whole generation of, of um, women workers. Once, once these truths come out and we start seeing what's happening with the rise of tuberculosis because people have not been getting vaccinated for this last year, uh, vaccines are down like 40%. Once we see a full accounting of the amount of despair and suicides and everything else um, that's been associated here, when we get a good look at the carnage, uh, there better be public anger and, and we need to uh, uh, educate people about what happened and of consequences. I mean, look, we are talking about the greatest failure of central planning uh, in our lifetimes and probably in many, many generations. And um, if, if uh, the pro-freedom agenda does not prevail, um, it's on us. We have a lot of work to do. That actually is a great segue into one of a question uh, from Jennifer Osborne, who asks what we, as well as the AIR, uh, can do to sort of communicate, educate decision makers on the state level, on federal level, in different countries to sort of make this message heard. And what is sort of your idea, in a sense, to let liberty prevail again? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the number one obligation is to get educated yourself, right? I mean, this is, I think, uh, Kai, this is a huge problem we've faced as a community since since January. Uh, we were uh, blindsided by this, and I don't think 
liberal intellectuals and uh, we're trained in economics, we're trained in philosophy, we're trained in law. And suddenly all these fancy people talking about, you know, r naughts and, and TLCs and uh, NPIs you know, started preaching at us and we didn't know what to say, we didn't know what to do. It's like, well, a lot of us hadn't really studied this topic, you know? So I think that's the number one obligation is to actually get busy don't be intimidated by the topic. I mean, these epidemiologists, these, these agent-based modelers are trampling all over human rights and they're, they're planning the economy. That's our business. They've bought, they have entered our sector to tell us what to do. We have to enter their sector and explain where they're, where they're wrong. Uh, we need to see where Bill Gates is, is, is insane. We need to read up on the good epidemiological tradition and public health tradition embodied in the Great Barrington Declaration and read Donald Henderson's treatise from 2006 and, and figure this stuff out, be able to talk about this stuff intelligently and don't be afraid. I mean, I'm talking like to, to, to you today and I, I think um, I try to be as intelligent and, and uh, uh, smart about this as I possibly can, but the truth is this lecture that I gave today, I could not have been able to give nine months ago because I didn't know a lot of this stuff. So how does it that I know it now? Because I, I spent a lot of time reading and listening to, uh, to real experts about it and opening up my brain and trying to figure it out. And so we all need to do that and stop being intimidated. I mean, if you care about human liberty, uh, uh, you need to get smart. And as, as you get smart, don't be scared of the Twitter mob, you know? So what? People gang up on you on Twitter. So what? You know, uh, I mean, a lot of people are not speaking out for career reasons, you know, and for political reasons. It's disgusting. Like you get some moral courage, get some backbone, get out there and, and, and speak, get smart and speak. And, and and I don't I can't guarantee we're going to win the struggle, but we sure as hell aren't going to get any progress as long as people uh, are hiding and, and quiet and not speaking out about it and saying stupid. Don't be stupid. Get smart and get loud and get aggressive, and let's let's confront uh, fearlessly uh, the lockdowners on their own territory. Tag them in your tweets. Don't let them get away with this. I know it works. I mean, this guy, Mark Lipsitch from Harvard, you know, he actually uh, debated. It, would, it was great. The American Medical Association sponsored a debate between him and Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford, and Bhattacharya just like wiped him out. This is a guy who's been hiding in his Harvard office, never mitigated, never seen a single patient, never cured a single disease, never, never dealt with any epi epidemic ever. He's just completely an egghead and living in his, in his heart, off tenure, getting, you know, uh, six figure incomes. God knows what he's paid, uh, especially with all the pharmaceutical companies that are backing him. So he was shocked. To, to, to be uh, destroyed by Bhattacharya in a debate. And later that night, threw down a few martinis and started hate tweeting all of us, right? <laughs> and insulting us. And so how do you deal with that? What you do is you come right back at him and you cite his own work at him. Because he had written a paper in 2008 in which he said that uh, uh, social dis distancing could be a disaster, creating more death among the old because the longer you delay herd immunity among younger non-vulnerable populations, the more you force the older population to bear the burden of it. That's what he wrote. So he was hiding from those words. All we had to do is go back to his article, screenshot, and highlight the section and say, what do you have to say now? You know. So he's, he's in shock that he, because look, this is a guy who's never had opponents, intellectual opponents in his life. And now he realizes there are serious people out there. They're going to hold him to account. That's what we have to do. And I'm sorry, if you're shy to do this, get out of libertarianism, become an Amazon, Amazon driver, you know, do something else with your life. But if you're going to be an intellectual who claims to love liberty and, and proclaim to be a liberal, you have to get busy. You have to take risks and you're going to have to speak out and you're going to have to face the slings and arrows of the lockdowners. And that's your job. Uh, and, and you have a, a moral obligation to do it. That's my own view. I think there really couldn't be a better way to end this than <laughs> this uh, motivational speech. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I, I sounded a little angry, right? I didn't mean to. I, I, <laughs> it I, sounded you know, very I, I used to be a happy guy. I think we've known each other a long time. I remember when I used to be a happy person. I, I'm still trying to be a happy person, right? That's but good. at the same time, uh, <laughs> now's the time to act. You know, what we've learned is that libertarianism and Austrian economics, this country, this is not a parlor game anymore. You know, we're not here just to go to our fancy conferences and, and throw down drinks with our friends and, uh, and, and gather more uh, 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 likes on Facebook. We have a battle to fight. And if not us, who? It is us. It is up to us. There's nobody else out there doing it. 
we are in this business because we want a thriving, prosperous, peaceful society. Uh, the world is crying out for answers right now. These are the times to engage the battle. We can do this, but we have to get uh, out of our living rooms and uh, and off Netflix and and get get serious and 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 get to work. And I think humanity will thank us in only just a few years. We can win this. Now you just became optimistic again. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So that's uh, that's great. I just posted uh, in the Zoom box. Um, I already posted the Donald Henderson link, um, and I have just posted some links that our listeners can check out for Jeffrey's work as well as the AIR's. Visit AIR.org uh, for the Austrian Economic Center page. It's AustrianCenter.com, and then for those who speak German, we also have the Hayek Institute page, which is Hayek Institute. AT. Um, thanks again, Jeffrey, for being with us or having been with us today. And thanks all of you for joining us today. And let's let's fight this battle, as Jeffrey just said. I'm deeply honored that you had me. So thank you very, very much. Let's be in touch.